Let us pray. Oh God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, you who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Well, in 1969, Sears Roebuck and Company was the largest retailer in the world with about 350,000 employees. And they decided that they needed a central office for its, many of its employees. And so the company hired architects to design what would become one of the largest offices in the world. After breaking ground in 1970, it took three years to complete and it used enough concrete to make an eight-lane, five-mile-long highway. Rising 110 stories, it would be the tallest building in America at that time, and one of the tallest in the world, the Sears Tower. In 1988, Sears and Roebuck Company sold and moved out of the building, but the Sears Tower remained the same. It was renamed the Willis Tower in 2009 after the Willis Holding, uh, Group Holdings, the global insurance broker, bought it. My son Ezra attended Judson University just outside of Chicago for his last two years of college. And so while he was there, we made a couple of trips to the Windy City ourselves and did the touristy types of things that one often does, including a river tour sponsored by the Chicago Architect Architecture Foundation. Uh, we boarded our boat, headed up the Chicago River. It was an absolutely gorgeous day. We cruised up and down the river learning about the amazing architectural history of the great city of Chicago and about halfway through we got to the end of one of the outlets and the boat turned around and just stopped for a few moments because looming up ahead that building in black was the Willis Tower, formerly Sears Tower, all 110 stories of it. And as we moved directly beneath the tower, the guide pointed out something near the top. Jutting out were four enclosed glass rooms. I don't know if you can see them from where they are. Let me see if I can get a little uh, closer. There we go. Uh, this is called the Sky Deck Experience. And for the right price, you can travel up uh, 103 floors and literally stand out over the city, right? Look down through that glass bottom floor. Can you imagine what the view must be like? Well, you don't have to imagine because we did it. Here's my daughter, Emily, uh, inside doing her thing in the sky deck. We took a number of pictures. She had choreographed all the pictures that she wanted us to take. You only have a certain amount of time, right, in the box. And she's like, okay, directing. We're going to do this one, then we're going to do that one. This was in the early years of Instagram, so she was ready to go. Uh, and uh, here's what the unencumbered view looked out uh, from the side of the other side of the 103rd floor, looking out over Lake Michigan, an amazing view. Here it is looking north of Chicago. You can probably see Wisconsin if you have good eyesight up in the distance. And uh, I, I thought at least it was worth the price of admission. So glad we had the opportunity to travel up one of the tallest buildings in the world to see what we could see. Welcome to the fourth week and our very unusual and I hope very fun for you, it is for me, summer sermon series entitled The Gospel According to Dr. Seuss. Now each week we're examining one of the many classic works of Theodore S. Geisel, aka Dr. Seuss. Uh, some of the stories we've known and loved since childhood, others are a bit less familiar, but every bit is fun. And through each of these seven weeks, we're looking at what are some of the main themes that we find in the story of Dr. Seuss, and how does that connect with some of the main themes from the Bible? Today, we are greeted by Yertle the Turtle. How many are familiar with Yertle the Turtle? About, about half of us. All right. Well, the rest of you are in for a treat. Are you ready? Here we go. <clears throat> On the faraway island of Salamisan, Yertle the Turtle was king of the pond. A nice little pond. It was clean. It was neat. The water was warm. There was plenty to eat. The turtles had everything turtles might need, and the turtles were happy, quite happy indeed. Uh, they were until Yertle, the king of them all, decided the kingdom he ruled was too small. I'm ruler, said Yertle, of all that I see, but I don't see enough. That's the trouble with me. With a stone as a throne, I look down on my palm, but I cannot look down on the places beyond. This throne that I sit on is too, too low down. It ought to be higher, he said with a frown. 
If I could sit high, how much greater I would be. Uh, why, uh, what a king. I'd be ruler of all that I see. So, Yertle the Turtle King lifted his hand, and Yertle the Turtle King gave a command. He ordled, or ordled, he ordered nine turtles to swim to his stone, and using these turtles, he built a new throne. He made each turtle stand on another one's back, and he piled them all up in a nine turtle stack, and Yertle climbed up, and he sat in a pile, and what a wonderful view he could see most a mile. All mine, Yertle cried, oh, the things I now rule. I'm king of a cow, I'm king of a mule, I'm king of a house. What's more beyond that, I'm king of a blueberry bush and a cat. I'm Yertle the turtle, oh, marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. So as I was reading through this story, the first biblical story that came to mind, of course, was the story of the Tower of Babel, right, from Genesis chapter 11. Now, it may not be because of the main theological reason most of us think about when we hear the Tower of Babel story, which is how the spreading of languages and cultures and peoples spread around the globe, but you might find a uh, striking similarity. The story takes place only 11 chapters into the very first book of the Bible, right? The book of Genesis. And it all begins after creation with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. But then after one of their children, Cain, kills the other child, Abel, things start going downhill fast. So much so that God eventually decides uh, it's time for a divine do-over and sends out a flood to wipe the slate clean. Only Noah... Kudos, Noah, and his family escape uh, with a whole boatload of animals. Uh, eventually, they become, they grow to become a multitude of people, and that's when we get to this story in Genesis chapter 11. Now, the whole earth had one language and the same words, and as they migrated from the east, they came upon a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly, and they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens and let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise, we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Now, of course, the Old Testament is written by Israelites. It takes place in and around the area of Israel. Michael Williams, in his Storyteller's Companion to the Bible on Genesis, makes a very interesting point. Israel was known for having an enormous quantity of stone. And quite literally, stone was the only good building material in the area in which they lived. Even in Israel today, almost every building is made out of stone. But where this story takes place in Babylon, things are quite different. Huge structures are made out of sun-dried brick. It was a material that was better suited for the hot and dry climates of the lands just north of the Persian Gulf. But for an Israelite, as Williams put it, no fool would make anything out of brick unless they were Babylonian. So these uh, Babel Tower builders are using the wrong kinds of materials to make their sky deck, at least in the eyes of the Israelites. They're also using the wrong kind of binding material. They're using pitch. Pitch is a water-based substance. Mortar would have been the material of choice for stonemasons, not pitch. So that's two strikes against them immediately, even before the first brick is laid. So every Israelite hearing this story from Genesis chapter 11 would have known it was doomed for failure from the beginning, which is kind of like our friend Yertle the Turtle choosing to build his new throne out of the backs of other turtles. Probably not the smartest choice. Why did he do it? Because he was only focused on himself, right? He wanted to see more. He thought that he deserved it. He was only focused on himself. What was the intent of the original builders of the Tower of Babel? Very similar. Come, let us build ourselves a city. With a, and a tower with its top to the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, otherwise we shall be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. It was all about them, everything for their own glory, for their long-standing survival, and of course, to get a better view all the way up into the heavens. Well, at least Yertle wasn't trying to go that high, right? Not yet. <clears throat> 
And all through that morning, he sat there up high, saying over and over, A great king am I. Until long about noon, then he heard a faint sigh. What's that? Snapped the king, and he looked down the stack, and he saw at the bottom a turtle named Mac, just part of his throne. And this plain little turtle looked up, and he said, <coughs> Uh, beg your pardon, King Yertle. Uh, I have pains in my back and my shoulders and knees. How long must we stand here, your majesty, please? Silence! The king of the turtles barked back. I'm king, and you're only a turtle named Mac. You stay in your place while I sit here and rule. I'm king of a cow. I'm king of a mule. I'm king of a house and a bush and a cat. And that isn't all. I'll do better than that. My throne shall be higher, his royal voice thundered. So pile up more turtles. One about 200. Turtles, more turtles, he bellowed and brayed, and the turtles way down in the pond were afraid. They trembled, they shook, but they came. They obeyed. From all over the pond, they came swimming by dozens, whole families of turtles with uncles and cousins, and all of them stepped on the head of poor Mac. One after another, they climbed up the stack. Then Yertle the turtle was perched up so high he could see 40 miles from his throne in the sky. Hooray, shouted Yertle, I'm king of the trees, I'm king of the birds, I'm king of the bees, I'm king of the butterflies, king of the air. Ah, oh, me, what a throne, what a wonderful chair. I'm Yertle the turtle, oh marvelous me, for I am the ruler of all that I see. Then again, from below, in that great heavy stack, came a groan from that plain little turtle named Mac. Uh, your, your majesty, please, I don't like to complain, but down here below we are feeling great pain. Uh, I know up on top you are seeing great sights, but down on the bottom we too should have rights. We turtles can't stand it. Our shells will all crack. Besides, we need food. We are starving, groaned Mac. You hush up your mouth, howled the mighty King Yertle. You've no right to talk to the world's highest turtle. I rule from the clouds over land, over sea. There's nothing, no nothing that's higher than me. So the people in Genesis chapter 11 have a plan. We're going to use the wrong building materials to build something tall enough to see the cow, mule, house, blueberry bush, and cat of God, or something along those lines. Verses 5 through 9. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which mortals had built. And the Lord said, look, they are one people and they have one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do. Nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their language there so that they will not understand another speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth. And they left off building the city. Therefore, it was called Babel. Now, I know the story is usually looked at in terms of how humans came to have different languages and different cultures that were spread around the earth, but I want to focus more on the tower endeavor this morning. What was the original intent of the builders, according to the storyteller? They wanted to build a tower to reach up into the heavens. How interesting, though, God, whose realm is in heaven, had to come down to see the tower, right? Meaning despite their best intentions, they didn't even come close to accomplishing their mission of getting up into the heavens with God. Sometimes we don't even recognize that our greatest aspirations still pale in comparison to God's view of us, which is something Yertle the Turtle came to figure out as well. But while he was shouting, he saw with surprise that the moon of the evening was starting to rise up over his head in the darkening skies. What's that? Snortled Yertle. The, what, what is that thing that dares to be higher than Yertle the king? I shall not allow it. I'll go higher still. I'll build my throne higher. I can and I will. I'll call some more turtles. I'll stack them to heaven. I need about 5,607. This is kind of starting to sound like our story from Genesis, isn't it, right? The theme of building, construction, and planning, though, is carried over to a second scripture passage that I want to bring in for our consideration. This one from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 7, beginning at verse 24. Everyone then who hears these words of mine and acts in them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on the house, but it didn't fall because it had been founded on rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not 
act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rains fell, the floods came, the winds blew and beat against the house, and it fell. And great was the fall. Biblical scholar M. Eugene Boring in his Interpreter's Bible Commentary on Matthew mentions that this um, situation, this scenario would have been quite familiar to Palestinians during Jesus' day. You see, most of the houses in Palestine were built during the dry season when not a drop of rain was seen on the horizon. Most houses are built then when, in the most favorable of weather conditions, they all seem secure at the onset. It's only when the rainy season comes that the true test of a house's staying power will be evident. When the rains and the winds and the floods come, the houses built on sand will be washed away, while those built on rock will remain secure. You see, it's not the building materials that differ. Jesus doesn't say that, well, some of the houses were built out of stone and mortar, (laughs) while the other foolish ones built it out of brick and pitch. No, no, no. The houses are built the same. What's different is the foundation on which they're built. And what was the foundation that Yertle the turtle built his uh, throne on? Oh, yeah, the backs of other turtles. What could possibly go wrong with that, right? But as Yertle the Turtle King lifted his hand and started to order and give the command, that plain little turtle below in the stack, that plain little turtle whose name was just Mac, decided he'd taken enough. And he had. And that plain little lad got a little bit mad. And that plain little Mac did a plain little thing. He burped. And his burp shook the throne of the king. And Yertle the turtle, the king of the trees, the king of the air and the birds and the bees, the king of a house and a cow and a mule, well, that was the end of the turtle king's rule. For Yertle the king of all Salamisand fell off his high throne and fell plunk in the pond. And today, that great Yertle, the marvelous he, well, he's king of the mud because that's all he can see. And the turtles, of course, all turtles are free as turtles and maybe all creatures should be. So why did Jesus tell this mini parable of the two two home builders? Everyone who hears these words of mine on acts of them will be like a wise man who built his house on a rock. This parable, Jesus says, is about whether we're listening to the words of Jesus the words of scripture, the words of the prophets, the words that have come through the holy book over the centuries, and are we building our lives upon the truths that we find therein? Immediately prior to this story in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7, or at least the beginning of chapter 7, it's all a part of what's known as the Sermon on the Mount, right? Where uh, Matthew records Jesus' longest teaching, where he lays out the basics of how he challenged his followers to live their lives. A life of mercy, purity, peacemaking. A life of humility and righteousness. A life of grace and forgiveness. A life of charity a life of spiritual discipline, a life free of worry, trusting that God will provide our basic needs, a life free of judgment to others and ourselves, opening, uh, our, uh, open, open to desire what God wants for us rather than what we think it is that we need most. It's a pretty amazing couple of chapters, Matthew 5, 6, and the beginning of 7. Um, for those of you that want extra credit in heaven, I invite you to read it later today. Probably only take you about 15 minutes or 20 minutes or so, and you will, uh, be, you will be blessed uh, as you read through that. Jesus wants us to know it's not enough to just hear his words. It's not enough to simply come to church or to worship online and then leave unchanged. We have to be willing to build our lives upon the foundation of what we hear in the words of Jesus and in the scriptures. We have to be willing to put into action what it is that Jesus is calling us to do. How does one live out their Christian faith? Well, here at Palmdale United Methodist Church, we actually have a discipleship plan that can help. Uh, I remember when I was first learning about discipleship plans, they said it's kind of like 
if you go to college and just decide you're going to go to the football games and eat in the cafeteria, and that's going to be your only college experience. You're not getting the most out of what you can have at college, right? Like taking classes. And so, so uh, advisors and counselors help you lay out your basic cores and then what your major is going to be and maybe a minor and advanced degrees. Well, here is that equivalent of living out our faith as disciples. We have four areas that you can live out your faith. Worship, spiritual growth, relationships, and service. And all begins... Uh, what we're here doing on Sunday morning, worshiping each week, um, although now with online worship, it doesn't have to be on Sunday morning. It could be any time during the week that we connect with a community of faith and with God. But then it has to move beyond that. And we're, involved, we're called to be involved in the life of some kind of spiritual growth activity, right? Whether it's being part of a life group, a small group that meets once a month for about 90 minutes, or reading the Bible on a regular basis. Scripture journaling is a wonderful way to do that. We have information about that on the church website and the church app as well. And if you want extra credit, you can join us Monday and Tuesday mornings online at 8 o'clock as we share scripture journaling together. Or come on Wednesdays, not this week, but come on most Wednesdays for Food for Thought. Be part of youth group or the young adult group or other small group gatherings. We need to be involved in some kind of spiritual growth outside of Sunday morning. We're also called to be involved in the lives of others. Christianity is not a solo sport. It is a team sport. We need to be connecting with one another, building our relationships. And then we're challenged to give ourselves away, as Jesus did, in love and service and mission and in acts of justice to the larger community. There are some ways that we do that here through the church, but many of you have other uh, missions and ministries of, uh, of programs and wonderful uh, community involvement that you've been doing for many years. That's fabulous as well. Let us not, my friends, be like the foolish ones who build our lives on shifting sands or on the backs of turtles. Let us not be so focused on ourselves that our lives are all about me, myself, and I as we seek to be the kings and queens of all we can see. Instead, let us build our lives upon the solid foundation of Jesus, the foundation that God gives us. It's not mere babble. This is life and all of its abundance. If only we'll be able to see what's right before our very eyes and choose to act on it. Thanks be to God for the silly story of Yertle the Turtle and yet the deep truth that it and the scriptures contain. Amen? Amen.